Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Pyotr Yan of dunking on the average Dagestani MMA fan, Jack Slack, and it's the Jack Slack podcast, and we're coming at you on Monday the 6th of December. Advent calendars are well underway, Crimbo's approaching, and um, we had some bloody good fights at the weekend, bloody good fights. Prior to these fights, I was calling it the big weekend for the bantamweights. Now I'm going to call it Karate Lads Get Dunked On Weekend. <laughs> because of, uh, well, almost exclusively because of the Bellator card. But um, yeah, some good stuff. Some heartbreaking stuff. Heartbreaking. The worst finisher you know scored a finish over your boy. Um, but we'll talk about Bellator afterwards. We'll talk about UFC first because that's the way of things. You can't bury the lead after a load of bollocks about Bellator. So, first things first, Jose Aldo, what a man, what a man, what a man, what a perfect man. Um, I thought this was a horrible matchup for him. High-volume boxer, guy with a great gas tank, guy with a great jab, going to make Aldo move lots, going to make Aldo expend a lot of energy, tire him out, batter him towards the end. And Rob Font hits pretty hard for a guy who focuses on volume. Jose Aldo, meanwhile, didn't get the memo, or he did. <laughs> Someone said he was in... Uh, uh, like, des- uh, complete energy conservation mode. Because this is the thing with Jose Aldo. If you want to beat him, you've got to drive the pace up. But as we said last week on the boycast, the problem with that, it's the same with, like, Yoel Romero or someone like Well, I mean, Yoel Romero is a very extreme example. But people like that where you have to drive the pace up to tire them out. You have to put yourself in danger to, du- to drive the pace up. That's the problem of it. You know, um, Max got dinged hard. Fyodor Yan got dinged hard. It's very hard to drive a pace on someone without giving them a fair crack at your chin. And we've all seen fights where, like, oh, I mean, Izzy versus Yol or any number of fights, you know, against a guy who's supposed to gas out. And because the fighter who's trying to take him into the later rounds doesn't really do much, they're fighting in the later rounds and it's just like they're fighting in the first round. It's, it's not much different. So, yeah, I said after this fight, I feel for um, Rob Font because he did everything he should have on paper. He was trying to drive the pace up. He was doing great work with his jab. And then once around, he'd get cracked and his confidence would just be completely shaken. You know, if you watched his first round, he was dominating Jose Aldo. He was looking beautiful. Um, and then he got cracked. <laughs> and then if you watch him, he comes out for the third round. He's got his confidence back. He's doing brilliant work. And then he gets cracked and it all goes to shit again. And, you know, it's a cliche, but power is the great equalizer. Um, yeah, did, did feel for him here because he did what he was supposed to do. And then he just got hit. Uh, but it did happen multiple times, so fair play to Jose Aldo for finding him. But um, in the first round, Rob Font came out, poked him with the jab. Jose Aldo is immediately trying to inside slip or slip inside of the jab to the um, chest side rather than the elbow side and throw the right hand across the top, the cross counter. And what Rob Font was doing was he's flicking out the jab, and as he did it, he'd get down behind his own shoulder. Aldo's right hand would ding his shoulder, and then he'd catch behind Aldo's head and pull him down for an uppercut. And he'd uppercut the body or he'd uppercut the head and... You know, throughout this fight, he was coming back with four punch combos at various points. It was a really nice use of the jab against a guy that you know is going to try and counter the jab. And then his first takedown attempt was gorgeous too. He he went to shoot like head outside single because Jose Aldo, when you shoot for a double on him, he turns sideways and feeds you the single by blading his stance very long. Again, read advanced striking 2.0 or just watch like the first fight with Chad Mendes for like... You know, that's a 30 second fight and he does it about three times in that fight. But he turns sideways and presents just one leg. He puts the other leg out of reach and behind him so the opponent can't drive through as effectively. So what happens is that every wrestler just picks up that leg, the leg that's in front of them, for a single leg. But their head will normally go to the center to pick up a single leg. Um, And Aldo will throw in the whizzer, which stops the person going behind him. Because that's the problem with turning sideways on. They can go behind you if you don't throw the wizard in. Uh, And what Rob Font did here was he like shot as if he was going to go for a double. Aldo turned sideways and Rob Font used his, um, he had his head outside and he used his uh, inside hand to pull Jose Aldo's lead leg past him and he just went straight to Aldo's back. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was a perfect um, choice of technique for Jose Aldo. It was like he had looked at him and gone, yeah, well, that's how I'll get him. Because he could have tried to run through a double all day and it's not going to work with Aldo trying to feed the single. Uh, And he could have picked up the single, but then he'd be, you know, on a single against a guy who feeds singles and defends singles for a living. Um, So he did a a crafty little sort of like leg drag get behind him. It was was gorgeous. 
did fall off through the fight because then he started taking worse shots from further out because he was feeling so uncomfortable. And then he'd end up underneath Aldo. And we got to see Aldo's ground game extensively in this fight without him ever hitting a takedown. <laughs> it's like Frank Shamrock, you know, used to brag about how he can't take people down anymore because he has bad knees. Um, but if they go to the ground, he'll beat them. And you're like, no, just just do some clinch takedowns or something. <laughs> you don't need to shoot. <laughs> but Aldo doesn't have wrecked knees. He could be shooting takedowns. He could be dropping in on hips. He could be taking people down along the fence. Because he has an awesome top game. If you watch his passing, even back in the day, his feet are so active. He's pummeling them to, to great position. He's mounting people from everywhere. He's mounting Rob Font with overhooks. Rob Font's got the underhook and he's like working to his side to get up. And Jose Aldo's just like, yeah, no, I'll just mount you. <laughs> he's, he's brilliant at it. Um, you know, world-class jiu-jitsu at one point. And certainly world-class jiu-jitsu within MMA at this point. Now, I think what was interesting was that Aldo caught him the first punch that Aldo caught him with and, and sh shook his whole shit up. Um, and he did it again later in the fight, but it was just a very straight one-two down the center because he'd been trying to throw that overhand across the top and trying to counter. And obviously his left hook's very famous. Um, and he tends to use the jab, but in like standalone poking at the person as hard as possible instances. Um, so he just popped a one-two like boom, boom you know, um, real quick. And that was enough to to shake up Rob Font's whole shit, as I said. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Um, and then through the rounds, he kept catching Rob from time to time and changing the whole round around. Um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't... As someone who, like, wants him to get back in and, and beat these guys who, are, who have worked out that they need to keep the volume up, it wasn't the way I wanted it to go in terms of like, I want Eldo to just suddenly not be bothered by people who are trying to put the pace on him. Um, but this was just like, he has to land a big shot every round. Uh, and, you know, against very uh, slick fighters, that might be tricky and might not be the most reliable way of doing this, but you can't help but be happy for him. You know, <laughs> Rob Font was ranked, what was Rob Font ranked? Number four in the world. Um, so yeah, pretty insane. And I pointed this out afterwards, you know, I made my little um, Habib joke at the start there. But, uh, you know, I pointed out that Jose Aldo has fought, I think, nine times since the Max Holloway, the second Max Holloway loss. And he's fought top 15 ranked guys every time. Might even be top 10 ranked guys every time. Uh, and Habib, you know, that's that's more. I, I said that's as many good fighters as Habib fought in his whole career. And I was generously counting people like Tiago Tavares, uh, Ally Quinta. I think you can count Alec Winter. I think he might have been top 10 ranked. Oh, no, he was top 15 ranked. But um, people like Pat Healy, Abel Trujillo, Blayson Tebow, you know, to count those guys a little bit. Mm, you know, the number of top 10 ranked guys uh, uh, Habib fought is at like four or five. And, you know, if you, you, you could honestly make a case for discounting McGregor because he basically only won one fight at lightweight and uh, took two years off and has been awful at lightweight ever since. But, you know, that's not to shit on. Habib Nurmagomedov. That's just to point out the difference between like being all time great, hanging around, beating top level fighters through multiple eras, through your own prime and then after your own physical prime. You know, that's that's real like greatest of all time shit. Uh, whereas just relying on the like, but I never lost. And then you go, well, you, you pieced out after like three title defenses. And it, it didn't help that people were like, it's not his fault he couldn't fight the best in the world. They all ducked him. And then you're like, well, they all ducked him before he was champion, and then he was champion, and he quit. You know, and I'm not going to judge him for quitting because his father died. You know, that's obviously horrible. But you can't have it both ways. Be like, no one wanted to fight him, and then when he got the belt, you're like, well, you know, you didn't want to fight. But these people are fucking weird. Guys who are just obsessed with Habib Nurmagomedov. You know, if he'd hung around and fought as often as Jose Aldo, he'd have lost at some point. And I wouldn't hate him for it. I wouldn't, like disregard his legacy for it but it's these people who are like well it's more important that you don't lose and you're like you're going to ruin the sport you're going to turn it into fucking boxing but anyway jose aldo real goat shit real goat hours um where does he go next i mean uh, basically lining up the title fight i suppose or maybe they put him in against someone like sanhagen um for like a obvious number one contender fight i don't know i you know i don't think he can beat Jan. i the, the one thing that i don't you know, Jose Aldo, I feel like his issue is that he is great. He's adaptable. He keeps changing. He keeps growing. Um, but he's not adaptable in terms of, like, he can fight a completely different game plan for the same opponent the second time round. 
Um, I just have never seen that from Jose Aldo. You know, if someone's beaten him once, well, I, I mean, basically this has only happened about against Max Holloway, but like he came back and did the, the same things that he lost doing and Max Holloway won. Um, you know, I don't know if he can do something that isn't just the standard Aldo game plan. Which works when you're like dead to rights better than everyone else. But if they're fighting really clever and they're as good as you, um, you know, you have to then change. The onus is on you to change. And I don't know if Jose Aldo can do that. But anyway, rest of this card. Um, there were some uh, crackerjack finishes on this one. So co-main event was Rafael Fiziev versus Brad Riddell. And this one, yeah, absolutely lived up to expectations because so often it's like two great kickboxers going to fight Let's have a wrestling match. Or two uh, two big bangers going to fight like William Knight and um, Alonzo Manyfield, which I said, no way this one could suck. And then lots and lots of stalling along the fence. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about that fight extensively, but fucking hell. Imagine being the USADA guy at the UFC watching that fight. You're just like ducking beneath the table until that fight's over. Because those guys, to the gills, mate. Or at least very until very recently to the gills, mate. I also meant to put the soundboard in the um, the sound clip of the guy saying that this isn't a coincidence or there's no such thing as a coincidence because that that guy is also named William Knight. <laughs> but Fizia versus Brad Riddell, they just went at each other and it was great. It was like two angry cats just screaming and clawing at each other. Um, Fiziev backed him up to the cage almost immediately, controlled. This is the thing, controlled the cage. He was clearly making Brad Riddell uncomfortable and deciding where the fight was. But until the end, he wasn't really taking advantage of the ring position at all. Um, until uh, Brad Riddell circled out into a wheel kick. But for a lot of that fight, Brad Riddell was being very active with his back foot on the cage. Um, no Superman punches off the cage, very unfortunately, but you know, you don't fuck around with that against someone like Fiziev. Fiziev was looking for the counter head kicks when he came in, which I absolutely love. You know, he was, he was, um, ruining Moicano's day with that, throwing combinations and closing the door, not with a left hook, but with a left high kick, which I suppose is closing the door, but also isn't because you're giving them your leg. But if you whip it up as fast as he does, um, it's more their problem than it is your problem. And that was one of the main things that I noticed in this fight. Like, even if you're choosing to stand and bang, you've got to make someone like Fiziev pay for those kicks. You've got to catch him and, and follow in. You've got to catch him and take him down. You've got to do something to stop them kicking as frequently. And Brad Riddell just couldn't. He was just taking them on the forearms or um, even on the body, which is never, never great. And then, you know, trying to come back. But already you're on the end of his reach because he's using the lead leg high kick. Um... Did like Riddell's uh, low kick entry because obviously Fazev is so fast, he's so light on the lead leg. He's going to check any kick you throw at him naked. So Brad Riddell was just throwing the right low kick into his shin, you know, because Fazev is going to pick it up and stepping it, shifting in with punches after that, coming in um, southpaw and swinging. And it worked quite well throughout the fight. Fazia was doing a great thing where he was like pressing into the fence and then trying to glide back and high kick or glide back and body kick underneath the punches, which worked very well throughout the fight. Um, Riddell got the only takedowns of the fight, got a cut, uh, did he get two? Second one, well no, the first one he basically couldn't hold him because Fiziev is very good at getting back to the tripod or the quad pod or whatever and building up. Um, and Riddell was basically left with the choice of like, do I stay here and try and knee his legs? Um, but he just went two hands on, shoved him away because you don't want him like spinning out of that with a back fist as we'll get into later, unfortunately, <laughs> but, um... Yeah, the uh, the finish was quite a surprise. Came out of nowhere. Fiziev just changed to to orthodox briefly. Brad Riddell started circling along along the cage past uh, Fiziev's lead foot, and Fiziev just turned into a, a wheel kick. And the chin on Brad Riddell because he was done on the wheel kick, but he also wasn't done on the wheel kick. <laughs> like you got watch guys run into wheel kicks like that, and they flop down dead. That's what happens. And he stumbled back into the fence, but like. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have even been ruled a knockdown in kickboxing. It was incredible that he just took that on the chin. I mean, he he looked completely out of it. He was sort of waving his hands instead of defending himself. Um, but he did dive on like a low single when Fiziev came in. I mean, he yeah, he was done. But what I'm saying is fucking hell the chin on that lad to take that kick. Flush on the jaw. I think it was the heel as well. Um, yeah, mad. But great fight. Great fight. Can't recommend it enough. Um, 
yeah, it wasn't a whole lot of like habits that I picked up on it, but it was just two very interesting styles meshing. And it helped that they knew each other. And it also helped that even though they knew each other and they both knew what each other was capable of, they didn't fuck around by like, well, I'm going to wrestle him for the whole fight or whatever, which is what happens a lot of the time here. It felt very... I don't want to say honourable because then you get into like Bushido nonsense, but it did feel like they both sort of like came out, shook hands, and they were like, yeah, let's do this. But how mad is it that Bobby Green almost out... Well, maybe if you you scored it a certain way, he did outstrike Fazeev. Um, I I suppose that just speaks to weird styles, which is something I was thinking of actually in in Jamal Hill versus Jimmy Crute, because Hill is coming off being murdered by um, Paul Craig. Jimmy Crute batted Paul Craig. But Jimmy Crew got smashed by Jamal Hill. And it's just, you know, Styles making fights. But, um, yeah, lovely counter right hook from Jamal Hill. Knocked him to, like, a knee early on. Caught him again in the face. And then I I think I'm just getting squeamish in my old age now. But some of these follow-up shots on the ground are making me very, ooh, uncomfortable. This was one. Like, Crew was pretty much out of it, but he just smashed him square in the nose. Fucked him right up. I mean, he landed like four strikes and Crute's face was in a war zone afterwards. Um, and, you know, that's, a, that's one I'll give credit to Sergio Pettis for because he knocked uh, Koji out, came in as if to drop the big hammer fist. Ref didn't stop him in time, but he did realise and he, he just went, no, I'm not going to hammer fist him in the face. Whereas you've got guys like Nganu, Derek Lewis, Dan Henderson back in the day, who will just hit a corpse because they want to. Yeah, not much to say about Hill versus Croup, but good for Jamal Hill. I mean, very exciting guy on the feet. Absolutely dreadful on the ground. Um, yeah. Clay Guida versus Leonardo Santos. Fucking hell, lads. Oh, Leonardo Santos. Doesn't look 40 until round two. Then he looks 40. <laughs> but so, oh, man. He came out and he looked like Leo Santos. Just a fucking monster for however long in the first round. Hits Clay Guida with a front snap kick to the to the body, ball of the foot, lovely stuff. Uh, am I Gary, as uh, Michael Bispin correctly pointed out? Clay Guida is winded by this kick, goes to the fence. Leonardo Santos comes in, pours it on, and gasses himself the fuck out. And I was watching this fight thinking, Dominic Cruz is at home with his dog, biting the couch cushions and tearing them apart because... It was Keith Peterson just letting Clay Guida take a thousand punches and knees to the head. And uh, Leo Santos is like, why aren't you stopping it? And we're all at home going, why aren't you stopping it? And then because he didn't stop it, Leo Santos gassed out and Clay Guida, worse for wear, but coming up still in shape. And Leo Santos just had nothing. Like the first three minutes of this round were 10-8 Santos. The the last two minutes of this round were 10-8 Guida. Santos was dead on his feet. And you're thinking, like, maybe that's the inexperience, you know, to only have... Well, actually, I suppose it's like 20 fights, he said, but, like, against top competition, quite a low number of fights um, at this advanced age. You know, to to fall for that, which is such a... It's a mistake that everyone makes at some point, but typically fighters get it out of the way, and then guys who are good finishers learn that they're not going to get the finish by... Well, you will get the finish by spazzing out, but at a certain point you go, okay, it's not worth spazzing out anymore. Let's consolidate. Let's hit the body. Let's maybe get a good position, start working to pound him out from mount or whatever, or, or choke from the back. But uh, Santos is like letting Clay Guida dive on single legs and hide his head between his legs and, and hammer fisting him in the side, like basically in the arm and side of the head and be like, why aren't you stopping this? Uh, and it's very hard to get a stoppage from there with good refs or experienced refs. So the second round starts and Clay Guida just goes after him, gets an easy takedown. And Leo Santos basically just lets him get on his back and choke him and, and taps out because he's completely gassed. <laughs> it's fucking awful performance from Leo Santos, which started out as an awesome performance. So, um, yeah, keeping with the... the the Santos spirit of things, but at least he's not a problem for the UFC anymore because he was a 40 year old who was winning every fight and fighting once a year and nobody knew who he was, but he was getting close to being ranked. <laughs> it was kind of like the Trinaldo situation where it's like, fuck off and lose, please. Um, or what they've got with Leon Edwards now where they're just like, go away. We don't want you. Oh, Chris Curtis versus Brendan Allen. I, how does Brendan Allen have fans? The only things I've ever heard from him are just him talking mad shit and then probably losing. Um, but yeah, this was a fun... Uh, Chris Curtis, his career in the UFC is my favourite thing going on right now. Because if you remember before that 
first fight in the UFC where he was called in as a late replacement. And we were like, why the fuck wasn't he signed when he wheel kicked a dude on the contender series? Because now you're signing people who like grind out three round decisions. But he'd had a little run outside. Well, he'd had a complete career outside the UFC. But after that contender series win, he won some fights. He went to PFL. He lost all three of his fights in in PFL. Two against the same person, to be fair. But, um, you know, it was was looking like, oh, man, might have missed his chance. He got some more wins on, like, the the regional circuit. Got that short notice call against Phil Hawes, who is a very scary prospect. And he banged him out. And, well, after a, a round of, like, working him out, he banged him out. Uh, and then he gets another scary prospect in Brendan Allen and bangs him out. Um, so he's on a six-fight win streak now. I oh, know seven-fight win streak. Sorry. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Oh, he was due to fight Austin Vanderbilt in Bellator. Wow, that's interesting. Um, but this was very similar to his Phil Hawes one. He's just a crafty old fella who fights from a weird southpaw shoulder roll. And it was very interesting because against Phil Hawes, he was having... You know, he was having to take some shots. He was having to take some good kicks um, and uh, getting beaten to the punch early on. But then I, I think I said, like, I was watching it and I saw him time a lead hand counter uppercut, which is a very tricky punch, especially Southpaw versus Orthodox. But a very tricky punch. I said Alexis Arguello, uh, sorry, Arguello was uh, probably the best example of that working because you've got to get the guy as he's like walking over the top of it. And it's a very small window in front of you that that uppercut takes up. And I saw him just sort of like scuff Phil Hawes with that timing and coming in. And I went, oh, hold on. And I, I opened up uh, Paddy Power to try and get an in-play bet. I was going, oh, hang on. And before I could even find it, he would knocked him out with a counterpunch. <laughs> so it was just him getting his timing. Um, and it was kind of similar to this one. Like Brendan Allen came out, was the prospect, looked impressive. Chris Curtis looked half his size, was sort of trying to walk forward, but getting blasted back from time to time. Uh, trying to learn to time some counters and things. Uh, there was an interesting moment where Brendan Allen uh, pulled guard on or pulled the uh, leg attack, which was quite interesting. But um, the knockout in this one was lovely. Brendan Allen jabs at him. Curtis is southpaw versus orthodox. Curtis parries his hand at the elbow, at the same time slides down the side of his lead foot, pumps out the jab from the parry, so parrying to jab while hopping down the side. As he's hopping down the side, he throws the left hand to the body, comes up with the right hook to the head, does eat a right hand coming back at him because his hand, his left hand's down as he's recovering from the left body shot. But the right hand dings Brendan Allen and sends him wobbling and he, he pursues him for the finish. Um, and he was moving away from Allen's right hand as well because he was gliding down the side of him. But he was just really pretty. Just very clearly hundreds of rounds of practice very experienced guy. I said th- what this guy could be having is the Jersey Joe Walcott career path. I mean, if you haven't heard it, go listen to the Jersey Joe Walcott history episode. But Jersey Joe Walcott was a uh, a very impressive heavyweight prospect in boxing. But he was around during the time of like the Great Depression and he had six kids. So he had to go and work in factory all day and then try and fight in the evenings. And he had a really badly broken arm too when he was coming up as like an amateur or a, a young professional rather. Um so he ended up working in a factory trying to feed his children and stuff, and he didn't have the time to train full time. So he's doing the same things that like um, Charlie Burley and, and other great uh, impoverished black fighters were doing at the time, where you work like a full shift at a factory and then you go and have a fight in the evening. And the fights are you're going through the motions to pick up a paycheck and you might win, you might lose, but you're not, it's not, you haven't peaked for that fight. You haven't trained for that fight. It's just a fight that you're taking while trying to keep your training up in between and working a job. And there was a, a, a numbers, or some kind of racketeer called Felix Boracicchio, I think it was. And he took an interest in Walcott. Um, oh, the other thing was that Walcott like got, um, every time he was given a break, he sort of fucked it up. Like he was given a break as um, Joe Lewis's sparring partner, and he knocked down Joe Lewis in front of all the press and everything. So uh, everyone knew that he was capable, but they were like, fuck off, we don't need you in camp. Um, so Felix Boracicchio said, I will pay you like, I don't know, whatever the sum was. It might've been like a hundred dollars a month or, you know, equivalent of that in great depression time, um, to just train and I'll pay for your food and stuff. Uh, and it, it means that the guy gets a massive cut of the fighter, which isn't great, but having that allowed Walcott to put together some wins and become heavyweight champion of the world. But if you look back at his career, it's just like checkered losses and wins, losses and wins until, he gets the chance under Boricicchio to train full time and work like that. 
And uh, you get the sense that like having UFC money and UFC bonus money can only make Chris Curtis better. If he's been fighting in all these like regional shows like XMMA, Icon Fighting, Fierce FC, um, PFL. He, he was signed to Bellator, the ultimate regional show. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm just making up that narrative in my head, but it is quite cool because he also fights a little bit like one of those savvy old timers. And I fucking love that. But yeah, if you haven't seen that one, 100%, one of my favorite fights of the night. Po- possibly my favorite, actually. Um, he's just so small for, for a middleweight and he's banging these dudes out. Alex Moroni beat Mickey Gall, but honestly, the less said about that, the better. Um, oh, Manel Cape beat Zaglas Zum- Zumagov. My new uh, mythical fighter, arrogant Manel Cape. Because like well, after he uh, struggled in his first UFC one, he looked crap at his second UFC one. He's like, oh, where's that legendary knockout artist? Kai Asakura not looking so great again. Um, and then he got a, a flying knee win over Odie, whatever his name was, where the guy was giving him a lot of trouble and... The knee hit, the guy went down, and the referee basically saved Manila Cape from having to fight the rest of the fight by stopping it. Um, but yeah, he came in loaded with confidence in this one against Zaglas Zumagov, and uh, yeah, gave him a really hard time, knocked him out. Um, Zumagov landed some good blows of his own. Cape is interesting. Like, sometimes he seems very... Uh, sometimes he seems very skilled, and other times he seems like he's just got the power and the speed. But in this one, he was getting quite creative with his combinations and stuff. So, um, yeah, more of this, and maybe he will get the uh, flyweight title shot. And then Chris Gritzmacher lost again. How is that a few on the trot now? Because he had a really bad injury. And then he came back and just looked awful against um, Alexander Hernandez. Yeah, he beat he beat the tar out of Joe Lozon back in 2018. Um, was due to fight Benil Dariush. That's an interesting matchup. Um, in, 28, in like November of 2018, got injured. Booked to fight in uh, 2019, tore his ACL. Um, so then he came back against Alexander Hernandez and he looked like someone had just let all the air out of the tyres. He couldn't really move or do anything. When you'd like, seen him against Joe Lozon, I mean, he did, he did okay against Davy Ramos and Chaz Skelly, other good guys, but like against Joe Lozon, he just beat the tar out of him. Um, did get the win over Rafa Garcia in his last one. But this Claudio Pulez one, he just looked like deflated again. I mean, the third round, Claudio Pulez gets on a leg, is working from outside Ashy, which is when you've got like, think of going for like a straight ankle lock, but instead of having one foot inside, you put both feet to the outside of their hip. Um, It's a weird position in grappling. Sorry, trying to put my glasses on with my headphones on and I couldn't work it out. Uh, It's a weird position in grappling um, because it does open you up to back takes from the bottom. Basically, your attack is the outside heel hook, but the other guy can stand over you and take your back. Happened to Craig Jones against um, Kanan Duarte, most famously, and that's why guys have stopped going for it. But basically any position where someone's on like a straight ankle slash outside heel hook, standing over them is probably the best sort of uh, thing you can do. And uh, the grits just sort of stayed there like he couldn't really stand up. He just looked really tired. Uh, Finally did get his knee to the mat, which is disastrous for um, that sort of leg entanglement because your foot is under your butt your knees on the mat, you're just crushing the guy. Now he's not working on a leg. Um, so he passes uh, and gets to like a turtle position, or rather, um, Puelez goes to the turtle. But as Puelez turtles, the Grutz leaves his leg in between um, Puelez's legs, which is like number one cardinal sin for the turtle. When you're in the, when you're in the turtle, you do not put your like your leg between their legs or like up their butt crack because they can roll through on a knee bar. It's like the only way that they can get that leg attack from there. But uh, yeah, he just, he seemed completely gassed because he stayed there and then the guy rolled through on the knee bar and he didn't really do anything to defend it. He didn't squirm or struggle. He just slowly watched him extend it, tried to wait it out and then tapped. Um, So yeah, just a a bit of a deflating performance. But yeah, Claudio, uh, Claudio, 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 Juelez, the the weird priest with all the projectile attacks in... um, Tekken. Uh, Yeah, he looked good, I thought. But I reckon that'll do it for the UFC card. What else was there? I mean, oh, sorry, yeah, Vince Morales uh, caught Lewis Smoker. This is a sad one for me because I love Lewis Smoker. I love what he does. And he's a friend of the podcast too, but uh, he took a photo with uh, uh, Valentina on one of the media days for one of the UFC pay-per-views. And he was like, I'm with your girl. (laughs) At Jack Slack. Um, But 
I love what he does because he, he he works the body. He works the body with like two punches in a combination. So he'll go like jab right straight to the body, left hook to the body. Um, and he throws lots of lovely calf kicks. And he's got the first side kick to the face knockout in the UFC. Um, you know, he's doing lots of interesting stuff because he used to be really more of a grappler. But yeah, he's he's really giving Morales a hard time catching him with these check hooks when Morales is going to the body. Grabs the double collar tie, hits him with the knee to the body and the knee to the head. And then just as he's moving out, it was the Andy Hook one where that guy double collar tied him in K1. The guy's about 6'10 and Andy Hook's like six foot even. <laughs> but just on the way out, he swings the overhand across the top and just chin checks him. Unfortunate, can happen. You know, it's one of those things about the, the double collar tie. Uh, if you're not keeping the guy off balance, there's that window when you exit, you know. It's, um, it's why guys like... Um, Peter Ayats and stuff like that. They used to just shove straight out of the, the double collar tie. And Anderson too. Like he'd just shove you out of the double collar tie once he was done holding it. Straight arms, shoulders up, push the guy away by the face. Actually, on the subject of pushing people away by the face, that brings us on to the Bellator main event, which I'm sure everyone was looking forward to me crying over. Um, <laughs> yeah, this, was, this was insane. I mean, there's no way to watch this and not be... One, entertained. Two, impressed. Both impressed by the skill of Kyoji Horiguchi, which I th feel like a lot of US audiences didn't get to see much of because rising events are quite often tricky to watch, doubly tricky to pirate or stream. Um, and, you know, this, this was him a little bit more available for US fans. But because he's been training at ATT and everyone at ATT has been singing his praises, Mike Brown said he's the most talented guy in the gym. Jorge Masvidal said he's the most talented guy in the gym. You know, everyone says how talented Kyoji Horiguchi is. I feel like this was a great showcase of his abilities for people who haven't seen him. However, he did lose. <laughs> and it was a really sad one too. And even sadder because like there's a photo of him leaving the cage with like a neck brace on, on a stretcher or a wheelchair sort of thing. They're carrying him out and he's got his hand up in the air waving at the crowd, just be like, I'm okay. Uh, and then he put out this statement because he only speaks like, you know, a few words of English, but he put out this statement being like, I just want to apologize to anyone I disappointed. <laughs> Like, just, no, but you were so good. Don't worry. Um, but, yeah, uh, the first four rounds of this fight, or three rounds, sorry. Well, three and a half rounds. Sergio Pettis literally couldn't touch him. Because in the boycast, which, you know, if you're a boy, go back and listen. But if you didn't hear it, we were talking about how Sergio Pettis basically relies really heavily on this, like, little backstep right-hand counter. Sort of like the Conor McGregor back backstep left hand, but doesn't come in over the open side. But he just does it over and over and over again. If you watch his fight with Juan Archuleta, uh, basically his two best fights, Juan Archuleta and Joe, Joe Benavidez, weren't like him looking super sharp. It was more like those two guys just drove their face onto it over and over again. They were sort of running forward aggressively and, and giving him straight lines. And Joseph Benavidez just kept giving him it. And uh, Juan Archuleta sort of like got turned off by it. He was like, oh, I don't want to run in anymore. And that allowed Pettis to come forward more in sort of um, one twos and low kicks. But in this one, yeah, I, I thought it'd be interesting because that back stepping right counter was the one that Kai Asakura actually caught Horiguchi with. So I was going like, well, if you can start to get the read on his on his um, entries, you can slide back with him, give yourself a little bit of a buffer zone and hit him with the counter. But yeah, nothing came close here. Uh, Horiguchi was, um, his feints were so convincing, like he does these big shoulder feints and Pettis is leaping back away from them. Uh, his entries were on point. He's just smashing through Pettis' guard. And he's got this jab where he he leaps in, and I suppose in karate it'd be a kizamizuki because it's full weight. You're supposed to try and murder the guy with the punch. But he goes in on it and he'll hit the guy in the face and then he'll leave it out there and push them with his fist. Um, and it was very interesting because in the first or second round, he hit the Frankie Edgar post single, which is like lead hand into the shoulder, palm open, and pick up the lead leg with your other hand. And if you do it well, if you time it well, you can just bundle the guy straight to the floor. But if the guy's got good balance, like a BJ Penn or someone like that, Edgar picks up, picks it up, pinches it between the legs and starts working on a single leg. And we're always talking about that technique because it's like you will not end up on the bottom of a sprawl going for that. You might not get it, but you won't end up underneath the guy. But Horiguchi kept doing that, and then he'd land this big jab, and he'd push Sergio back and duck down, and sometimes he'd come across the top with the, right, with the overhand right, and sometimes he'd pick up the leg instead. Uh, sometimes he'd go down and tap the knee and then shift through and hit him with the left hand. He was throwing a, a spinning back kick, which he I don't think I remember him doing very much in the past, but he landed about five of those. Uh, and Pettis, Pettis took them in the gut, like just 
took him, which is fantastic for him. You know, tough lad. Uh, to be honest, I, he's been finished like once by um, Ryan Benoit way back in the day. So he's, he's very tough. Like he's not going to get banged out of there. But um, the takedowns were perfect from Horiguchi. You know, not something that he does a lot of or had done a lot of because he's normally just knocking people out. But mix those in wonderfully. He's in round four. His feet are still light. He's bouncing. He's looking amazing. Um, I will say uh, Pettis, because we joked about how Kyoji Horiguchi's UFC run was like before he went to ATT. He would be winning fights and then randomly he'd just let the guy climb on his back and be stuck against the cage standing with the guy on his back. Happened in like three of his fights. Um, and Sergio Pettis, I talked about like, I often call him like the man with the least urgency in the world because he gave up his back to um, Minio Romero. Fuck, what's his name? Oh, Juicy F. Omega. Um, and he didn't do anything. He just stood against the fence holding the you know baseball bat grip on, on the choking hand. Not letting him choke him, but not doing anything to like get out of the position. And he lost the fight. And that was like title eliminator. He just had no urgency at all. Um, but in this one, Horiguchi kept getting to his back and Pettis would, would grip the the um, choking hand with both hands. And he was doing a, a pretty good job of, of both getting back up. And then um, I think it was around three or four. Horiguchi's getting on his back. He's got the seatbelt, one arm over, one arm under. Pettis is holding the top arm and he manages to suck the top arm deep so that he could basically like um, roll Koji over his head. That's something you'll see from time to time. Like if you if you can get the the choking arm really deep and they don't have the opposite hook in, they're like sort of um, primed to fall over the top of you. You do a little tripod bump and then you can pop your head up and go uh, get out. Basically, it's a really nice move, and he did it to Koji. Um, but yeah, the the finish of this fight, Pettis hadn't been able to like hit him with a, a handful of rice up to that point. Duke Rufus was saying, "Give me volume, throw jabs. Doesn't matter if you miss, do it." And that's the thing about like the distance Horiguchi uses. You you don't feel comfortable pumping double jabs because he like he won't fall for that. He's so far away. <laughs> um, so Rufus is asking for volume. Pet- Pettis isn't doing any of it. But Koji Horiguchi hits him, comes into a clinch. On the way out, Pettis looks for a high kick, which is a, a both Pettises do that quite a lot. Look for high kick, tummy out of kick uh, clinches. One of Pettis's first UFC fights, he stops a single leg, gets the quarter nelson which is like one hand one arm overhooking and one hand on the head and then you link your hands up and you push the head away and he, he tries to high kick a guy from the quarter nelson which is incredibly dope but um you know anthony pettis and sergio pettis both do that thing where they get the back body lock along the fence and they throw up high kicks while they're holding the back body lock but yeah he throws the high kick misses horiguchi's on the way out he spins all the way through on a back fist clacks him straight across the jaw like he only catches the bottom jaw it was about the worst connection or the best connection for Spet is the worst connection you could ask for for Horiguchi. And Horiguchi just goes stiff as a board, falls down. Uh, Pettis goes in for a big hammer fist, realizes he's done, doesn't throw it. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, the the worst finisher in MMA. Because <laughs> like, it's been eight years since he got a knockout. Um, he did guillotine someone in his first, like some scrub in his first Bellator fight. But it's been eight years since he knocked anyone out. And to pull it off when you're so far in the hole and you have a reputation for not being able to like finish people or pull fights back if you started losing them. I was really impressed. I mean, I wasn't, I was mo- mainly impressed by Kyoji Horiguchi just beating the brakes off him for four, you know, three and a half rounds. But to get back into the fight in that way and also just because it was such a cool thing. I mean, that's got to be a contender for knockout of the year. Uh, unbelievable. So if you haven't go watch that fight, go watch it and you will feel sad because Kyoji's so good in it. You're like, that feels unfair. But also good for uh, Sergio Pettis just for staying in there uh, because it'd be very easy to get disheartened by that and and um, start half assing it or just trying to stay alive because he's coming in and hitting you in the head and getting away scot-free. And then the other treat on Bellator was that I found out there's another Scoggins brother, um, Jared Scoggins, and he fought exactly like Justin Scoggins, which is do cool side-on side-kicking stuff uh, get knocked out, <laughs> like just just get hit once and fall over. Ja- Justin Scoggins was such a fun fighter, but he just found ways to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. He'd be absolutely dominating someone, and then he'd just go, "Well, I'm mixing a takedown. Oh, I've been guillotined." <laughs> Justin Scoggins could submit to a turtleneck, but Jared Scoggins got knocked out here, and he came in like five pounds heavy as well, which is never a good look. But I reckon that'll do our roundup for the day. So we'll do a question. But first, I just want to give a, a shout out to uh, my boy, Chris. Chris, F-I-F-N. 
um, who you will have seen probably. He's always in the comments being hilarious. Uh, he's been following along and, and encouraging for years. He's had some rough news lately, but um, I just I just wanted to say to him personally, because he'll be listening, hopefully, um, you know, I do see him <laughs> and I do laugh at all his comments. He's a funny lad. And um, well, I don't know what to say because. Uh, yeah, some things you can't really solve with words and uh, I'm always shit at those things. But thanks, Chris. You're a legend. And I, yeah, um, I just wanted to say thank you. Right, let's uh, hit some questions. Hold on. Hi, Jack. One of the annoying cliches in the UFC commentary is people like Rogan and DC talking about fighters needing to get their opponents respect, specifically in the context of someone eating a lot of strikes without landing many of their own. It sounds like bullshit because surely your opponent getting reckless and not worrying about coming back at him would be a huge advantage. Anyway, love the pod and hope you're well. Nicholas Thug Nasty. <laughs> oh God, he released a, a mixtape, no, rap, rap tape this week, which I need to go and listen to at some point. But um, I think the get the opponent's respect thing is a, is a real thing. Um, because when you start seeing someone putting together like Dutch kickboxing combinations on, on a covering opponent... That's because they have the confidence to step in and do that. People don't do that at the start of the fight. And the example I always give is, is Robbie Lawler versus Matt Brown. I think Matt Brown could have murdered Robbie Lawler uh, when they met if he'd been able to apply his pressure consistently. But Robbie Lawler immediately tries to take his head off and Matt Brown goes into like kickboxing mode. You're like, you're never going to win that match. <laughs> you, know, you know, you need to get in his face and make it ugly. Um so I think it is a real thing, but like the idea of respect is uh, an intriguing one anyway, because you always get the two guys circling each other and you're like, oh, well, they respect each other too much. And I've always felt like great fighters, when they really do respect someone, they want to get the the one and oh, you know, they want to get in the wing column as quick as possible, catch them cold. That was uh, Roy, uh, Roy Jones used to, I was about to say Roy Nelson. <laughs> no, Roy Nelson just tried to finish people in the first round because he literally couldn't go any further. Um, Roy Jones used to try and knock people out really early if they were good and he'd let them hang around if they weren't because the one you know if you if you don't want to deal with someone again catch them cold get that 30 second knockout they'll never be brought up in the same sentence as you again it's like when cub swanson was doing really well in the ufc featherweight division and people would just wouldn't consider a title fight between him and jose Alda because they were like well you saw what happened the first time like nothing did happen in the first time <laughs> like jose Alda came out with a switch knee that he'd never thrown off the bat before gubbs Watson basically wasn't even in his stance before he got hit in the head uh, it told you nothing about the matchup but um yeah the, the respect thing is is uh a strange but you don't really need someone's respect you need them to be concerned about shit coming back you need them to know that you're not a, a um that you're not just giving up for the fight, basically. And if you can't crack hard, that's where you do start to like lose fights that you could have got back into. Uh, there was an Archie Moore thing. He when he was uh, he was very briefly Muhammad Ali's trainer after the Olympics. The group of um, wealthy uh, where's he from Louisville Louisville businessmen who ha had like sort of a syndicate on Muhammad Ali's or Cassius Clay as he was early boxing career, professional boxing career. They sent him to Archie Moore because they were like, who knows more about heavyweight boxing than Archie Moore? And Archie Moore insisted that, like, you need to learn to crack because when everything else has failed, being able to crack <laughs> on the counter is what's going to save you. Um, and Muhammad Ali was having none of it. Uh, and they did not get along very well and he left the camp. I mean, I did a history episode on that, but um, it's not great to fall back on the idea that, like, power is everything in the sport, but power is a lot. If you could... Because the more people stand in front of you and try to hurt you, the more they open themselves up to counter shots. And if you don't have counter shots that will make them think, fuck, I need to stop throwing those punches, then they won't stop throwing those punches. And equally, if you have that power, them opening up more is to your advantage, as you said. You know, if you can get someone over committing and crack them with good counters. I mean, that was what Chris Curtis has been doing in his last two. He's been really slow starting, getting people's timing. They're opening up more and more, going like, well, you know, maybe maybe if I throw a couple more punches on the end there, I can put him away. And then bang, he's knocked him out. Oh, question if Whaley Zhang versus Carla Esparza were to happen. Hey, Jack, if Whaley were to fight Carla Esparza, what type of game plan would you give Whaley against Carla Esparza? Whaley has never fought a wrestler like Esparza. So do you think Whaley training with Henry Cejudo and Eric Albarracin would be a smart idea? I saw in a recent interview that Whaley with Whaley on the Chinese social media platform Migu. Oh, I've never heard of that. 
um, that she wants to come to Arizona to train with Eric and Henry three to four months before her next fight. What are some habits that Whaley could capitalize on against uh, Carla? Thanks, Jack, from Maria. Um, Esparza's recent run has been really interesting because she has sort of like... Her striking is still arse to look at, but she's sort of gamely pulled herself into it. Where if you watch like back in the singlet days and, and after that, there was a whole period where she was just languishing because she did have this tenacious, dogged wrestling, but she was almost like completely, re- she would refuse to engage in the striking. And I think just being willing to throw hands a bit has actually brought her more into the the, the game than uh, it otherwise would, you know, uh, just having that wrestling skill would. She basically used to be a bit of a sort of Habib slash, well, yeah, sort of Habib fighter where everything is the wrestling. Everything is just get on their legs, take them down, hold them, whatever. Um, and she seemed sort of scared of the striking. And really, I mean, she did get knocked out by Joanne and Jacek, but really there are not a lot of great hitters in um, women's MMA, especially down coming down to straw weight. You know, you've got some good technical hitters like Rose Nami Yunus and people like that, but not people who are going to knock you out with glancing connections and things. You know, if you could stay in their face and you fluster them, they're probably not going to be able to... to deck you in one punch with the exception of maybe Whaley Zhang and, and Jessica Andrade. Um, so yeah, being able to open up more has, has really helped Esparza. Um, for Zhang. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the la- who was the last one that, um, who was the last last that Carla Esparza fought the, was it Yan Jianan? Just looked fucking awful. Um, just chilling too much on the bottom. You know? Yeah. Even if the p- opponent is a better wrestler than you, you have to wall walk. You cannot, Stay on your back, be like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get him from here. I'll try and fuck it. Did you, did she try and buggy choke her or some shit? She just like had no hope. She was not trying to get to the fence and build up. It was really not a great performance. Um, and yeah, to be fair, I haven't seen an awful lot of walking from Zhang. I've seen her like people take her down and she'll just roll through with the momentum and shit like that. But I haven't seen her against that sort of grinding wrestler, which is interesting because they don't really. There's not many of them about in that division. Where's Tatiana Suarez, actually? She was a, a very exciting prospect for a little while. Oh, she beat Antaroff in um, June 2019. God, that's almost two years ago. Okay, yeah, hold on. Oh, she got injured. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, she was supposed to fight Roxy. Talia Santos took her. Okay, cool, 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 cool. But yeah, not a lot of wrestlers in that class. So I think just lots of war walking, um, timing counter needs, things like that, because Carla Esparza does shoot early and shoot often and a lot of the time it's sort of like ducking in for things um i think you know if you look at like henry cejudo versus dominic cruz brilliantly timed knees chop down the legs if you can keep her on the feet you know um standard sort of counter wrestler behavior to be honest but i i think the wall walk is probably the most important thing i haven't seen a lot of that from Wei Zhang. and if you can't do it you sort of lock yourself into these long periods on the ground i'm She's very strong and she's good in the clinch. So I'm not too concerned with her getting into that issue. That is the issue with like Habib, Islam, uh, Usman, Kamaru Usman, um, where you could wall walk up, but you'll get stuck there, you know, and then they'll take you down again. I'm not too concerned with that. I reckon if she walks up, she can probably either work or break away or start to use the double collar tie and maybe uh, angle out and start kneeing the old DJ special slash Verdum special. Um, but it's that getting up that's the first part. I think the other thing that kind of concerns me is that she does have a couple of like triangle wins on her record. And if you have the triangle wins, you might convince yourself that you will get the triangle wins. Whereas with an experienced wrestler like um, Carla Esparza, it's best to just say, I'm not going to triangle them. If I throw out the triangle, they're just going to use it to shuck past my guard. I'm going to wall walk. I'm opening my guard. I'm getting up or I'm opening my guard. I'm getting butterfly hooks. And then I'm scooting back to the fence or trying to elevate, you know, um, but yeah, make shit happen. Don't just stay there and hope for a submission. Right, I reckon that'll do us for today. God, I've got a lot of questions coming recently. And a couple of sponsorship requests. We're doing well, guys. We're doing well. I will never be sponsored on this podcast, probably, um, because I like being independent. It means that I can say whatever I want. It means that you all can trust that I'm saying whatever I want. Anyway, on that note, if you want to sign up to the Patreon, get in on the uh, boycast and the articles and uh, support the podcast, support me, the bastion of free speech in MMA, um, go ahead and do that. If you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fightprimer.com. And if you want to send an email to the podcast, 
jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack, and I will catch you later in the week for the boycast. Leo Santos on the SBGI treadmill protocol. Bless.